Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, a very warm welcome, that's the standard phrase, but it is quite a warm welcome uh, in many, in more ways than <coughs> one, to our um, redeveloped Bentham House. I, I can imagine for many of you it's the first time in, in Bentham House after the redevelopment. We've formally opened our Bentham House for business again yesterday. We had been in here already for a while, uh, but we're really very pleased as a faculty to uh, have a home again in this wonderful um, refurbished uh, building and, and invite all of you to come uh, as often as you can to explore its various parts and not just this uh, basement theater. Um, so this evening is also a little bit of a celebration of the reopening of, of Bentham House. Um, but we uh, want to do that with an academic debate and quite a serious one. Um, this is something which has been on my mind uh, since uh, basically the uh, EU referendum about two years ago, I think. And if I may recount a little bit of a story which is uh, uh, okay. pretty relevant and central to some of the issues we're going to speak about today. Uh, just after the referendum, there was uh, immediately a debate about the nature of uh, the, the sort of legal nature of the vote by the people and uh, what the next steps would uh, have to be. Um, and there was a debate about whether it was simply for the government in this country to notify the European Union of the United Kingdom's uh, intention to withdraw from the European Union or whether actually uh, Parliament needed to get involved and needed to uh, basically enact legislation to allow this to happen as the referendum was an advisory one. Now UCL was very prominent in the debate around this because I think uh, as you know, there's been a very famous case, the Gina Miller case, which uh, sort of started off, at least the intellectual basis for it, started off with a blog written by Professor Jeff King and uh, Dr. Tom Hickman from UCL, together with Nick Barber from Oxford, which was picked up by uh, practicing lawyers uh, and, and was the sort of foundation of the Gina Miller case. Um, and that case really was strictly uh, on the role of parliament and the role of government in, in uh, an important uh, political question, namely how to give effect to the uh, referendum outcome. Um, and what you saw nonetheless, even though uh, no one in the case argued that the referendum was invalid in any way or that the United Kingdom should not exit the European Union, uh, what we nevertheless saw uh, after some months when the High Court issued its ruling was that uh, newspaper called the judges enemies of the people. Um, and that was uh, absolutely unheard of in this country, of all places, I think. Um, now we are two years on, um, and I think we can all see how the, the rule of law and human rights are being challenged, uh, I would say, head on through populist politics and not just in faraway countries, but actually here and uh, in the West and in constitutional democracies. I'm not going to give too many examples, there would just be no end to that, but I can't uh, stop myself from quoting the President of the United States in a tweet uh, which he sent out, I think, on Sunday. Uh, I just read what he said, we cannot allow all of these people to invade our country. When somebody comes in, we must immediately, with no judges or court cases, bring them back from where they came. Our system is a mockery to good immigration policy and law and order. Um, and, and then something about children come without, coming without parents, because this was, of course, all triggered uh, by the debate about uh, the treatment of uh, children, immigrants, taking away from their parents. This is the President of the United States. So this challenge is really fundamentally different, I think, from, from anything I've seen, at least in my lifetime. Uh, it's not about what we used to see, a sort of occasional question mark uh, by politicians, a sort of fleeting critique of certain judicial decisions, uh, which, which of course one may disagree, or, or in some cases just to score political points. Um, I think it's becoming a challenge to the very foundations of our constitutional democracies. For, so for me, uh, I mean, there are many many aspects to this challenge, uh, but for me as, as, as a dean of a law faculty here at UCL um, uh, and as an academic, um, what this challenge triggers is a really big question for me. What do we as legal academics do to fight back against this challenge? Uh, it 
it seems to me that we need to do more than the usual stuff. Uh, it's not sufficient to write learned papers, even though they may be terribly important uh, in their own right. It may not be sufficient to just organize lectures and conferences. How much advocacy uh, should we be doing? What kind <coughs> of advocacy? How do we support critical lit litigation? How do we support NGOs? How do we support, in fact, the judiciary and the legal profession? Should we become, uh, in a sense, more political as institutions? Uh, uh, not just as individual academics, but also as institutions about the uh, foundations of our constitutional democracies. Uh, so take, take a stand, perhaps, even institutionally. These are some of the questions I have and many more. And I certainly don't have any clear answers to these questions. Uh, and perhaps none of us do. Um, and I think we've already started, started preparing a little bit our discussion uh, this evening beforehand. And, and it's clear that none of us have all the questions. But that's precisely the object of tonight, to uh, at least start a, a conversation around these absolutely uh, significant questions, I think. Now, in doing so, uh, I'm joined by uh, a really stellar panel of, um, of colleagues, who um, uh, academics who, in a range of ways, have been engaged in fashioning responses to uh, some of these challenges. One could say forms of, of legal activism, though I understand that in the, in the United States that is perhaps not the right term to use, but we would use it here. Uh, I'm not going to read out uh, the CVs of our, of our guests. They are on the uh, web page of this event. We would uh, have to spend too much time on that, I think. Uh, and they don't re really need uh, a lot of introduction. Uh, just a few words to my, to my right. Uh, Professor Kate O'Regan uh, of the Bonavera Institute of Human Rights in Oxford, uh, but with a, a, a very significant past as a a judge at the Constitutional Court of South <coughs> Africa uh, and very active in, in the field of, of human rights uh, and the law generally. Um, uh, on my left, our own Professor Philippe Sands, uh, uh, a very well-known international lawyer who is extremely active, not just in developing international law and contributing to it, but also writing about law and important, uh, basically, 20th century history of the protection of, of human rights. Uh, and crimes against humanity and genocide in books which uh, have become sort of uh, general literature for, for world population. Very pleased that Philippe is joining us. And then uh, on my far left, Professor Judith uh, Resnick from Yale Law School, who again needs no introduction, has been uh, uh, very active throughout her academic career, not just as a standard academic, but also in legal clinics in, in the US and, and working on equality issues and um, I mean a range of a range of topics which I you know whenever I read her CV I'm, I'm uh, absolutely bewild bewildered with how you find the time to uh, uh, to uh, engage with all these activities um, I should add that uh, we have uh, had the pleasure of being able to confer an honorary doctorate on Cato Regan last year and that we will be conferring an honorary doctorate on Judith Resnick uh, next week at, at graduation. So very pleased that they are both joining us. The idea is that they will each speak for about 10 minutes uh, on some of these questions. And then we really want to open it up for questions and debate with the audience, uh, really try to preserve a little bit of time for that. Kate, can I start right. with you? Well, thanks very much indeed, Peter, uh, for that introduction, and also for the opportunity to talk this afternoon um, with uh, some very deeply respected colleagues. <coughs> so these are difficult times, and um, I think these are difficult questions. And uh, I think we probably all come at it from the context which we know and what has formed us and what has made us who we are. And it made me think back to my very early days as a law student um, in South Africa. I, I studied law at the University of Cape Town in the period between 1976 and 1980. And for those of you who know the history of South Africa, the 16th of June, 1976, just uh, an, an anniversary that's just gone by 10 days ago, uh, was the day of the Soweto uprising. Young, young students uh, in Soweto um, protesting against being taught in the language of Afrikaans, which is not their first language in which they're associated with the apartheid state, um, were shot down by the police. And the events of the following, frankly, 15 years were a, a roller coaster um, in terms of the struggle against apartheid, of trying to bring, bring an end to uh, the system of uh, racial discrimination um, and injustice that was 
um, pervasive, um, really in many ways reawoke in um, July, uh, in June 1976. So they were dramatic times to be a law student. And I have to say that my strong sense of going to class was that there seemed to be very little context or connection between what I was being taught in class, which was the Roman Dutch law of property or the Roman Dutch law of persons, and what was happening out on the streets and what was happening in the country more broadly. And um, I became very involved in the University Legal Aid Clinic, which at the time was run only by students. And I remember going to give advice to members of the community in parts of Cape Town where black uh, people lived and finding that not only did I have no idea as to how to provide them with legal advice, but nothing in any of the law I had yet studied would provide me with any of those answers. So this disconnect, in a sense, between the law I was being taught and the law that actually people on the ground needed to know in order to, um, to be able to draw on their rights was, was, was complete and total. And so I felt very irritated with the law faculty and I felt, I, um, the other thing I learned in that context was just how when people who are poor, every single small problem, every single little legal problem creates an enormous barrier to being able to solve it. Problems that people who have some access to wealth can normally solve by a phone call or you know, purchasing some kind of solution, not, access, uh, not, suit, um, not uh, possible for those communities. And I also found that most, although sometimes we did win cases and sometimes we had some successes, generally I didn't think we were really making an enormous impact on people's lives. Um, so, you know, that, that experience of the disconnect between law school and the real world, the experience of law for people in deeply disadvantaged communities has sort of, I think, formed in many ways my approach to thinking about the problems we're talking about today and the problems in relation to my career. The next big learning curve I had was when I started acting for trade unions in the 1980s and I learned that actually law combined with social power was a very much more successful operation than law for communities when I was acting for just an individual woman whose husband beat her up and who um, and never paid her any money for the children. Um, there was, I could sometimes get <coughs> an order to stop her husband beating up which may or may not be obeyed and maybe he can, from time to time he may pay, may pay some money. But when I'm acting for a trade union which has got social power on the ground and we get an order, boy, that order suddenly gets implemented because there are a whole range of factors that, um, that, that back that up. And that was another lesson about the limits of the law and the importance that, that although law is an important tool, it's not the most uh, important tool in terms of bringing about social change or changing people's lives. And so fast forward to today, so, and I think you know, my experience on the Constitutional Court really reinforced all those lessons. There was nothing there that I'd learnt in those very early years of my legal career that was rebutted in the um, experience that followed. So what does all of that mean when thinking about setting up a new institution in a university in the United Kingdom that's committed to the project of human rights? Well, I think the first thing that it made me think of was that institutions need to recognise that they're not normatively neutral. The way in which institutions do things, uh, although they may not talk about what they're doing normatively, has an impact in the world. And just like as individual human beings, we want to think through the ethical, moral consequences of what we're doing, I think institutions need to do that. Um, and I think it's universities need to do that at a university level, but it needs to come down almost to every part of a university. And obviously there are a couple of very obvious norms that, um, that we uh, recognise that apply to universities, um, like the idea of academic freedom. Um, and I think that the, the, we need to have conversations about what that may mean within a university setting, in an environment in which we think the rule of law, human rights and democracy potentially are under threat. And we need to recognise that there are different interpretations of uh, norms, but we need to have conversations and debates, disagreement and discussion about them. And then I think university leadership needs to act on that. I, I do believe that universities should be led in a normative fashion by their leaders. Um, another area I think universities need to think about is that one of the main challenges we're seeing with the new populism is a challenge to science. Now, if there's one commitment that I think science in a university cannot renege upon. It's on the evidence basis uh, for conclusions, scientific conclusions, and the principle, in my view, of falsifiability for sci scientific hypotheses. And these 
of principles that have, upon which our understanding of science is based and which I think need to be defended uh, vigorously in the public space and need to be explained uh, as to why uh, science is, uh, bases its uh, methodology or epistemology on uh, falsifiability and evidence uh, as, um, as the way to develop our scientific knowledge. For law, I think that there are important questions around the rule of law. My experience in South Africa leads me to think that it's not particularly helpful to collapse into the rule of law notions of human rights and everything that's good, like democracy. I, I think there is something about the rule of law in the old Lon Fullerian sense of being uh, recognizing that law is about certainty, it's about in constraining power to be up to um, uh, compliance with law, it's about consistency, it's about independent decision making, which to me is a very important concept of the rule of law, which I think um, as law faculties we should debate and I also think we should defend. I understand the tradition of critique. I spent a lot of time thinking about critical legal studies myself in the 1970s and 80s. But as somebody whose life experience <coughs> has been in the global south, I personally am normatively committed to societies which are based on the rule of law. I don't think it's perfect and I don't think it's a complete um, solution to global problems. But would I prefer to live in a country that has the rule of law imperfect as it may be to one that doesn't? I absolutely. Do I think most people do? Absolutely, I think they do. I think there's something meaningful and valuable there. And normatively speaking, I commit to that and I think that is something that I think law schools should commit to. And it doesn't mean that we don't allow people to investigate and research in areas which might seek to undermine that in some critical way. But I think we should be thinking about training lawyers who are committed to the idea of the rule of law, understanding what it means. Human rights is a slightly more difficult concept for me because um, I think one of the great issues we have not yet resolved in our minds is what is the line between human rights and politics. Philosophers want to push human rights into a very narrow, uh, a narrow sphere, partly to, involve, to resolve many of the institutional questions, but partly also because there is the sense that people assert that human rights are universal and therefore we should try and go down on the minimum uh, common denominator, as it were, the thing that everybody can agree with. I'm not sure that's the right way to understand human rights. I think I'm not, sh uh, personally, I believe that human rights are something that should be, uh, um, we should recognize that it's not easy to sharply define the, the full edges of universally or in one place, and we should allow conversation to happen about that. But the broad project, which I, th which I <coughs> define as a project of treating all human beings with equal value, seems to me to be a project which again is worth defending. And I think that because I came out of a society like, was a apartheid society when people weren't treated like that. And to me it's just self-evidently something worth fighting for. And so if I think about the normative principles that I think a university should do, I think we should grip onto both of these. Finally, just a few comments on what I think an Institute of Human Rights should do. Well, I think the most important part of a university is a, the most important constituency in a university in terms of thinking about the world and changing the world are our students. Our faculty are very important and I think faculty at many universities are wonderful people really engage with these issues. But I think we need as an institute to think about how we can enable students to think about how they are going to be moral agents in the world and a force for good. And I don't think we should be too prescriptive about what that should be. But I do feel sometimes that the way in which we present law and teach law, and in the way, if I think about Oxford students, I should imagine it's the same at UCL, you get, you get you know, kind of caught, at, um, hijacked by the magic circle and the big um, barristers groups, and that seems to me the one way to be a lawyer. And I think we should provide you with better ideas and better ways of thinking about what it means to be a lawyer. And if you are a lawyer in one of those firms, what it means to be a moral good lawyer in those firms. And I think we can disagree on that, but that we should be talking about that, I'm absolutely convinced. Because I suppose I'm one of those very fortunate people who have, in the course of my life, seen law not be a perfect force for good, but actually be a force for good. Um, there is much more work to be done, obviously, in the South African context, and there, there's all sorts of ways in which um, we are failing. But do I think that this project, do I believe in the project of being a lawyer, a lawyer who seeks to be 
a force for good in the world, I really do. Um, I'm not sure all the time what it is to mean to be a force for good in the world, and I'm happy to debate that. But I think that's one of the things universities should do. Thank you very much, Kate. Philippe. Thank you. Thank you, Pete, for inviting me to be here. It's incredibly nice to be here with my two wonderful colleagues. Um, I mean, these are very personal matters. Uh, what is our social function as a legal academic? And what is our social function as a lawyer? And what's our social function actually as a human being? And I think the easiest way for me to tell the story of how I've got to the point that I have is rather in the same way that Kate started, how it all began. I went to an incredibly conservative law school as an undergraduate, which left me constitutionally opposed to the teaching of law as an undergraduate course, because I just think at 18, people are simply not ready. And I don't think it's the social function uh, of a law school to be preparing, or, or a university to be preparing people for legal practice. I think that comes later in life. Reasonable people disagree about that. That's my own experience. I spent three years at a place called Cambridge, and I then went and spent a year in America, which was an extraordinarily important year uh, for me. I was a visitor at Harvard Law School, and I found myself there um, in 1983-84, uh, in the midst of the critical legal studies debate, deeply excited by the fact that it was possible to be in a law school environment and talk about politics. Wow, that had not happened. At Cambridge University, we were presented with the law as though it was somehow self-contained, discreet, totally disconnected from all these other things. And I have to say, that year in the United States really transformed my thinking, I've come to realize now, um, uh, uh, over the place that law has in our society and my own function as a lawyer and as a legal academic. I came back, I followed a very classical route for someone who wanted to be a public international lawyer. I became a junior academic and I was told at the time, I think it wouldn't happen so much amongst modern public international lawyers, that you have to become a barrister and you have to try to do the odd case as a public international lawyer. And that's what you did. The connection with the United States was transformative in a number of ways. In 1989, I came across a US non-governmental organization in the field of the environment who got in touch with me uh, called the Center for International Environmental Law, which I did help found and encouraged me to become involved in various debates taking place at the international level on things that were at that time unknown, something called climate change, which of course in 1989 did not exist uh, as a subject. And I had the great privilege of being fully involved in all of the negotiations as a legal academic. Being a legal academic was extraordinarily important, I learned, because it gave you a heft and an authority because people perceived you as having a degree of balance. And I've always thought that the function of a university and of a law school is to be a broad church. I don't want to be part of a faculty where everyone thinks the same thing, where everyone is on this side or on that side. It's really important as a place for discourse, debate, discussion in a decent and fine way. I want to be challenged about the views that I have. I want to challenge others about the views that they have. That's the function of a legal community, including, I think, uh, an academic uh, community. And so I slowly got sucked in to that world of becoming a little bit and rather peripherally involved uh, in the world of lawmaking, the negotiation of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And because the governments I happened to work with um, from uh, actually the South Pacific, then became involved in the negotiations at an embryonic moment of the International Criminal Court Statute, or what became the ICC Statute, I became involved in that. And I found that I really enjoyed an involvement in that aspect, as issues that were debated in the classroom were also debated in a legislative forum. I learned from that. It challenged some of my basic assumptions about how international law is made. I, I, I can tell you I'm not starry-eyed. I care passionately about international law, but I'm not starry-eyed about international law, nor am I starry-eyed about how it is made. 
my dear friend Andrew Clapham and I were given the task of drafting the preamble to the statute of the International Criminal Court because everyone thought it was a completely nonsensical waste of time. So we'll give it to these two kids who are on the delegations of Samoa and Solomon Islands and they can do it. And we prepared a draft and astonishingly no one touched it and it became adopted basically without any changes at all. It is an absurdity that such a thing should happen in a proper legislative context and function. And lo and behold, just a few months later, before the House of Lords, uh, the preamble gets cited by some of the judges in the majority. Why? Because Andrew and I had put in to the preamble of the statute something we thought would be removed but was not removed, namely uh, every state has an obligation to investigate and, if appropriate, prosecute international crimes, something that we didn't fully appreciate had never been reduced into writing before in a binding international legal text. So, in the one sense, you participate, you learn how it is, but you also become a little bit sceptical because you see the reality of international lawmaking. That introduced me to a whole new world, international humanitarian law, international criminal law, human rights law. They were not part of my background before. And then, in the spring... The autumn of 2003, I found myself sitting at a dinner party in London uh, next to a lady who was an editor at Penguin Books. And she said, what do you do? And I said, oh, you know, telling people, telling editors you're a lawyer is usually an absolute killer um, at, at a dinner party. But when you're dealing with issues like Iraq, international crimes, Pinochet, people actually, I sense, find that quite interesting. And she said, you know what, if you can write, you can write me an eight-page proposal, I'll give you a contract. No advance, but I'll give you a contract. And you can write a book for Penguin about the place of international law today. I did it. It's the most complex eight pages, the most challenging eight pages I ever wrote. And my world was changed. Why? Two years later, I published a book that was called Lawless World and reached an audience which was, you know, 10,000 times larger than the audience that I love, my students, my academic colleagues, perhaps a few people in government. And what I understood was that there is an appetite in the larger community out there for what we do as legal academics, for the ideas that we debate, for the social function of law, and it excited me to have engagements going forward, not just with my students, which I love. I love being in the classroom, and not just with my colleagues, and not just people with government or with NGOs, but actually smart people out there from different disciplines, from different worlds, who are interested in these kinds of issues. And that door, having been opened, I was unable to close it. And it has taken me to a place where I now do see my function, having spent 25 years writing the solid legal texts, academic, published by OUP, published by CUP, academic articles, wonderfully read by nine people and their dogs, which is a socially very, very important thing to do, to try to reach a different audience with the things that I cared about. And I think that the world of legal academe, as I said, is a broad church, and it's not a one-size-fits-all model. What works for me at a certain stage of my academic career would not have worked for me 20 years earlier. And I certainly don't suggest that it's for everyone or that is what ought to be done. Writing in that direction brought me into contact for the first time with different kinds of disciplines, including literature, art, film, and various other directions that I'd not really connected with my work as a lawyer. And one of the books that I read that affected me deeply, which I think is a book for its times right now, was a book written by a journalist called Sebastian Hafner. I recommend it to a lot of my students. Um, it's called Defying Hitler. It was published posthumously. It was found after he died. Uh, and it described his life as a young man in Germany in the 1930s. And there's a passage of two or three pages of that book where he deals with his situation as a 25-year-old, not Jewish, 
um, although he had a Jewish girlfriend, who is training to be a judge in Germany in a little cohort of eight people. And he describes how over the course of a year, one by one, those who had expressed an independence of spirit, an abhorrence of what was going on, slowly peeled away, slowly got bought off. And that image has really struck with, stuck with me at, at this particular moment of where we are heading. I don't like to say this is like then, this is what we know history is different, we know things take different directions. But I think one cannot overstate the gravity of the situation we now face. In a context in which the two countries which essentially created the 1945 world order have fallen off their perches and do not have the resonance or heft around the world that they had before and are actively retreating from the world that they created. There is no madness to what Donald Trump is doing. There is absolute method to what he is doing. You can look through the prism of a systematic assault on the 1945 moment, created largely by the United States, to replace a multicultural, a, 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 a multilateral order with a bilateral order. It explains absolutely everything. It would not surprise me in the least if a year from now, or even perhaps in October, on the 75th anniversary of the departure by Germany of the League of Nations, October 1933, if Donald Trump announces the United States is leaving the United Nations. Because it is consistent with absolutely everything that his administration is doing. And so it's against that background that I think we as academics have a profound responsibility to engage decently, courteously, but with absolute independence of spirit, respecting also our colleagues who may have different approaches and different views in the social function of the place of law. Exactly the things that Kate talked about, not only at the national level, whether it's in South Africa or in Britain or in the United States today, where plainly there are challenges on the day uh, in which the US Supreme Court has uh, affirmed the lawfulness by reference to the US Constitution of a ban on travel into the United States which discriminates on the grounds of nationality. Read the introduction to Primo Levi's If This Is a Man, published in 1947, and compare what he writes with the nature of the legislation adopted by Mr. Trump's administration in which you target people solely because of their nationality. There is not a hair's breadth of distance between the two sense of direction. And what Primo Levi teaches us is that one thing leads inevitably to another. And that, I think, is the situation that we now face. And I rule out nothing as being impossible, either in the United States or, I have to say, on the day in which our esteemed Foreign Secretary appeared before uh, Parliament and declared very publicly he has a growing admiration uh, for Mr. Trump. We have a serious challenge ahead of us, and I think the social function of the independent legal scholar is absolutely central in reminding what the broader sense of values and issues and processes are as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe. Um, so many things on, on which I, I would love to comment. I, I won't, but I, I would add one thing, um, which is that, of course, the EU treaties from which the United Kingdom now wishes to withdraw have to me as their most uh, central principle, which has always been there, the principle of non-discrimination on grounds of nationality. Such an incredible achievement, uh, which is um, we, we need to be aware of, I think, and, and nurture. Judith. Um. The U.S. in 1964 has a statute on non-discrimination. 
So the discriminators are both Trump and the justices who misread that statute today. Mm -hmm. So I left the United States about 10 days ago, and I uh, did some work at Humboldt in Berlin, which of course means to spend time in Berlin is to spend time both with the history of the Holocaust and also the East and West, as well as great music and much else. And then I was at Hamburg at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Seas. And then I was, came directly from Jerusalem. And so I've just been struck, basically, by the political and legal imagination of the, these many places in these many decades in all directions. So the question for me is, where, how do we understand where we are now, and what is it that we can imagine? because we're called upon to imagine as the world around us looks extremely dark in lots of ways. And in the um, arc of the 20th century, the uh, uh, interested in the creation of courts as one way to represent aspirations for what law can do, it starts in the beginning of the 20th century at The Hague with the creation of the Peace Palace for a permanent court of arbitration, as funny as those words might or might not sound, to the League of Nations Court in the 1920s, and then the International Court of Justice, and then the ICC. So it's the arc is actually from peace to war, or to the dealing with the atrocities that war has produced, with Nuremberg as a central part of that discussion. And so then I try to think, OK, before us and now, there are many people in many settings imagining something that 10 or 15 years ago or 30 years ago we thought didn't exist and some of us thought would never exist again. What is it that can happen and what is our response in a world that is in many, many countries gripped by an anti-egalitarian, anti-human rights, not just rhetoric but practices, some of it sanctioned by legal institutions including justices on high courts. And so then, of course, the question is, what do we do? And there's, a, for me, a question of who's the we? And is there a distinctive role for someone who's got a first name law professor in behaving any differently than everybody else needs to be behaving in this way? And so the things that make the work that I do is one is that I teach, as my colleagues all here do, and the other is I do research and I write. And so one question that's been a puzzle for teaching dealing with people who come to be socialized in law in generations after I first started, is to think about how I talk about the baseline and the way to put this in a concrete way. In 9-11, the United States then takes people and puts them on an island called Guantanamo and keeps them in um, terrible settings and in torture. So I went to law school after the United States Supreme Court had decided a case called Miranda in the 1960s, which said that you cannot aggressively interrogate, that people have rights to be silent, that <coughs> models a form of the police interrogation with the state that puts the individual, even an individual alleged to have done very bad things, in a protective mode and actually says you have a right to a lawyer to be with you so you're not facing the state by yourself. And from going to law school at decade after that case had been decided, I never thought for a second I needed to know anything about something called the law, if that's the right word, of torture. I knew that there were, in the 1700s, interrogation techniques. I knew there were arguments about its efficiency. I knew, I knew moral claims and whatever. But the truth is I paid zero attention to it, and I know none of the ins and outs of it or knew nothing about it until, in the wake of 9-11, the United States is known in the torture memos to have licensed under, with lawyers, law professor lawyers, um, esteemed law school graduate lawyers, um, writing memos um, explaining why you could impose torture on other people and creating, trying to create li immunity for the people who uh, were uh, doing the t activity. 
So this is a topic in U.S. law. I teach a course about federal and state courts, about the court-Congress relationships, and the U.S. Supreme Court comes to the question because Congress strips the people of Guantanamo from access to the courts. And there's the legal question of its constitutionality. And Justice Kennedy, in a better era in 2008, writes an opinion saying that there's an unconstitutional limit through the habeas corpus. These people who are at Guantanamo have the right to a judge, not, not the tweet from the other day, but a, a fact-finding by a life-tenured independent judge. Now, in talking about this to people who are being socialized in the law now, there's a risk that I'm describing torture as if it was normal. Now we don't, there is a law of slavery too, and mostly it's taught in classes trying to understand the human exploitation, but not as a contemporary debate about whether it's okay to enslave people for a little bit if it's offshore and it's only for X hours or whatever the notion. But here I am in the midst of having to talk to people who haven't been socialized with Miranda as the as not, not that it wasn't that people weren't mistreated by the police, it's that the law didn't say you could do it. In fact, the law said you're not supposed to do it. So the critical space in terms of both rule of the law and human rights is what's the law's substantive content. And if I'm sitting here teaching new people what the law's substantive content is, I have an obligation, as I understand myself, to say that I'm talking about this as a problem because the law's substantive content is shifted to degrade people in ways that are grotesque. And that law can sometimes rise above it and rebuff it. Um, where are we now in the story? The person has just been uh, uh, confirmed to be the head of the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, and who says that she will no longer be authorizing torture is also a person who was very involved in overseeing the sites at which torture took place and was not prepared to say that what had happened was wrong with all sorts of buffers of institutional explanations of why she didn't say it. Um, so one version is Guantanamo is solely a dark uh, episode that continues to shadow and haunt and under, although, um, although we have an opinion today that talks a lot about presidential power, uh, President Obama wanted to close the site, uh, which is probably the most expensive prison on earth in terms of per capita. Uh, per the numbers of people there, but um, was unsuccessful because Congress stopped him, although our Congress isn't stopping the Muslim ban. Um, so, but there's a different aspect that I think Guantanamo contributed to in American discourse is that I also think a lot and have always thought a lot about people who are incarcerated in regular states. And so the next piece, one is the puzzle in these extraordinary times about how to teach about what law is, could be, should be, was, has been, and who are the speakers of the authority of what the parameters of law are. The <coughs> second piece is how not to be so overwhelmed by the extraordinary to ignore the ordinary, in which versions of some of the things we hate in the extraordinary take place in regular lives of regular people. So now I'll come back to the regular criminal justice system in the United States where 2.1 million people are incarcerated and another 5 million are under some form of supervision. And how does that come to be part of the curriculum and how does that function in terms of research and writing? What Guantanamo brought to the fore was actually a form, was solitary confinement as a practice which and the uh, optics, the visual optics were both of these people were being held at bay but because the our government, my government, wanted to show that they were being held at bay. We kind of got glimpses of some of the grotesque things that were happening in this no photography, photography, aerial photography story. And of course, many of us who've been involved in prisons know that in the United States and in other countries, there's a practice called solitary confinement, as in 22 hours a day for, um, or more, uh, for 15 days or more in the United States, sometimes for decades where a person is left in a very small room where food could be sent through a slit in the door where, there's hurt, where there may be an hour or two out a week or nothing and you're exercising in a, 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 core, a tiny space in a closet. Just terrible conditions in regular US prisons. And so one of the things I've always wanted to do was stop solitary and one of the ways to, of course to engage with that is to try to understand more about its parameters. So teaching in classes that are kind of traditional called 
federal courts or court Congress relationships, and then teaching in classes. Prison law, actually read in your book, that the two professors who invent the law of genocide and the, the idea, or engage and help us shape the ideas for both genocide and crimes against humanity, studied a course called the science of prisons. Mm -hmm. And so the science of prisons is a long conversation, but the law, the, law, the idea that prisoners have rights is an extremely modern conversation, really, in the wake of World War II on this side of the Atlantic and in my side of the Atlantic after the Civil Rights Movement. And so the idea of prisoners as rights holders is extremely novel. And in 2005, there's another US Supreme Court decision by Justice Kennedy written for the whole court. Their person is in solitary confinement. It's a class action about solitary confinement. And the argument is, you put me in with insufficient procedure. And the US Supreme Court holds that the conditions in Ohio solitary are so grotesque, as in losing all stimulation and just being indefinitely in a tiny place, that that rose to the level where the US Constitution's right to due process requires some procedural protection. And at the time, it was my I don't know, list of my most appalling decisions because all it did was authorize some procedure. But the question was, how can you stop the underlying behavior? So in the United States, we live with lots of federations and lots of different 50 states. Each of them has people who run prison systems called the directions of prison, or the prison head. You have governors and wardens and the like. These are the directors. And they have an association of state correctional directors. And we, the program at Yale that I'm involved in called the Lyman Center in memory of a man who um, Arthur Lyman, who was a lawyer in a, um, I don't know whether magic circle and big law and big law firms are all the same words, but he worked at a great big law firm in the, United, in the United States in New York. But he also was appointed to investigate Attica, an uprising of prisoners in the 1970s, and wrote the first instant paperback, by the way, reaching a large audience, and um, was very involved in prisoners' rights ever thereafter. And after, as he was ill and dying, they, there was an endowed professorship and an endowed program, which is now a center. So the Lyman Center, working with this thing called the Association of State Correctional Administrators through professional academic relationships, because one of the people had gotten a PhD at Yale, um, we ended up trying to figure out how many people are, how do you get into solitary around the United States how many people are in solitary? Question one, how do you get in? Answer is super easy. You just thought to be a serious threat to the institution. You, a prison staff member, think I'm creepy, and so you could put me in, and it's called administrative segregation because you're scared of me as compared to disciplinary segregation because you are punishing me for something as compared to protective segregation because you think I could be at risk of being hurt. So one question is, what are the rules? So <coughs> students. 50 state survey, survey, trying to figure out. Nobody knew what all the rules were across the United States, state and federal. Guantanamo is echoing around this because Guantanamo Bay is an example of this solitary. Then the next question is how many people are there? And the truth is nobody knew. And so we asked every jurisdiction, got the people who run the prisons to work with us to ask themselves. And right now, as of 2014, when we put out a book called Time in Cell, the estimate was 60 to 80,000 people were in solitary confinement in the United States. That's about the size of the UK prison population. You have solitary too, but in a much smaller number of, um, and with some different sets of procedures and protections and a much, much smaller number. Um, so then the question, so an example of institutions trying to deal with the ordinary underscoring that it should be seen as extraordinary for law faculties working with students is to do substantive research to do exactly this scientific commitment that there's a thing called fact out there and that learning about it, we should change what our rules of law or our practices are as a consequence. But apropos the idea of how much law can do, at the end of the day, no matter what wonderful courts might say something helpful, about forms of solitary, it's not going to stop unless the people running prisons want to stop it too. And prisoner uprisings have been an enormous part of the stop solitary movement in terms of efforts to um, hunger strikes and the like to bring attention to it. The media's played a huge role. But, and court opinions are tremendously important. But how do you get the 
practice of prison to think about this as an extraordinary, impermissible form of punishment as compared to a relatively ordinary form of punishment in which virtually every prison in the United States was keeping some numbers of people in some forms of solitary. And of course, one of the aspects that links all of us together is that through the United Nations, which started, um, uh, which has minimum standards for prisoners. Actually, let me back up one second. In 1933, the League of Nations puts out something called minimum standards for the, hu for the treatment of prisoners, and it's all couched in humanitarian terms. Law is not operating as a limit law is sitting there, not, it's not really there. You're supposed to feed them and give them food because as a humanitarian you're supposed to do it. But starting in 1955, the UN starts putting out standards for prisoners in which law starts playing a role and prisoners starts being agents in the law. And in 2015, negotiated in Cape Town are the most recent set of standards called the Mandela Rules, and the Mandela Rules say that, you should, that if you're in solitary for more than 15 days, that's torture. And I, in Boise, Idaho, which is on the map in the Northwest in a pretty rural place, being shown by a warden around a prison by a person who um, looked like he could have been in a TV show about showing me around a prison and taking me to their solitary cells says to me, we're trying to comply with the Mandela rules. So there are real places, I think, for law schools to generate curriculum and research and practices to look around at the ordinary and understand how you could imagine a thing called prison that comes without a thing called solitary confinement. And the director of the Colorado prison announced a prison system announced a couple months ago that there is no much, no, nobody can be there for more than 15 days in isolation, period, the end. Thank you very much, Judith. Um, with that, I'm going to open it up for, for discussion and comment. I think we're going to take a couple of questions, comments. Um, I was thinking whether we could structure them, but that's going to prove difficult, I think. So I'll just see who has his hands up first. Uh, Connor. Um, thanks very much for that. Uh, Jonathan, um, so thinking about kind of what uh, legal academics these kind of core functions uh, produce research and teach students. So you can kind of get a bit more you know, creative about you know, thinking of other things, but those are the two things. And in the UK at least, there's mounting pressure on both of those. And so when it comes to research, you have kind of, you know, cuts to academic pay, it's actually affecting who comes in the door to do research. And maybe the most obvious is uh, red research excellence framework. And um, so Philippe in particular kind of called for you know more creative thinking about how we actually get thought out there and stuff. But REF doesn't really allow that. There's a government framework in place that doesn't allow that, particularly for young scholars. And um, so you have a, a framework that ranks your research at universities that kind of go along with that and encourage you to produce certain kinds of research because that's going to affect their rankings. Go to a job interview, and they'll ask you questions about ref in relation to your research, and they'll ask you things like, "Have you ever done a successful funding application?" It was a question a friend of mine got recently. And on the teaching side, there's this kind of tendency towards um, <coughs> looking at the role of the academic as getting students ready for exams, or actually just getting them their degree, and making sure that they fill in a good feedback form at the end of the year, rather than you know, actually instilling an interest in knowledge or uh, in thought or in activism. And I don't think the forces that are pushing these sorts of pressures are um, entirely separate from the forces that are bringing about this sort of new populism and this erosion in the rule of law and in public discourse. So what I'd like to hear about is whether you think that before we have any kind of serious conversation about what legal academics can do in particular, we need to have a conversation about uh, where academia is going and whether we need to correct that course first generally. There's a question here. Thank 
you. And if you could introduce yourself as well. Uh, Chris Chapman, Amnesty International. Um, question for Philippe, really. Um, uh, I, I, I totally get it that the um, uh, that Trump's um, ruling on um, requiring certain nationalities basically not allowing them to enter the United States is a whole new, uh, something that we've not seen before. But couldn't we say that it's actually just an incremental step forward from, from what's been happening since the Second World War? We've always discriminated against nationalities in terms of requiring them to go through much more onerous procedures to get uh, access to countries. Um, in many cases, uh, these requirements are actually, actually <coughs> almost impossible. Uh, you could also say that the, the United States withdrawing from the United Nations is just a step forward from what it's already done, as in completely ignoring the United Nations when it goes to war against Iraq. Um, you could also say Matteo Salvini uh, refusing entry to the Aquarius was just a step forward from the EU's existing um, uh, policy on migrants, which was to have them stored in uh, camps in Turkey or to allow them to actually drown in the Mediterranean, making it extremely difficult for anybody to, 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 um, to save them. I'm not saying that it's, these are not horrendous things which are happening, but we, are, we, are we not guilty of allowing an incremental process of arriving at that point? Yes, this is a substantive new, you know, it's a new level of horror, but we've allowed uh, this to happen incrementally. This one here. Good evening. Uh, my name is Andrew Balson on the LLM here at UCL. Uh, as far as I've taken it in so far, we've had sort of three different modes of legal academics engaging outside of the strictly legal academic sphere. We've had a bit uh, in the beginning from Professor Regan about um, ways that students can perhaps obtain more valuable skills of uh, helpful in legal clinics they aren't learning from black letter law in all uh, classrooms. We've heard from Professor Sands about engaging with the wider public in literature and interdisciplinary works. We've heard from Professor Resnick about working with other institutional actors outside of legal academia. My question is, particularly towards the leap's ends, but I'd also like to hear from across the panel. Um, Professor Inko started with a quote from the Trump tweet, and I'd like to read out another tweet that's gone around recently in response to that. A lawyer named Ronald Klein has said, if Trump can deny due process to those allegedly here unlawfully, ICE, that's Immigration Customs Enforcement, can grab you alleged you aren't a citizen and deport you without a hearing. He posted that and heard back from a lot of people saying, not me, I can prove I'm a citizen. You miss the point, says Ronald Klein. Without due process, who will, you, who will you prove it to? Where will you show your proof? A right to a hearing, judicial review, protects all of us. My point in this is that there's obviously still a disconnect in reaching out to this wider public. We also had a debate in legal Twitter Twitterati recently about whether court decisions are too legalistic or need to deal better with political realities. This leads me to my ultimate question for the entire panel, which is what is the register in which legal academics can engage with a broader public? What is it that uh, academia and those of us as not going into academia go into practice? How do you think that we can best engage with the public and get across these core values? Uh, three great questions. We'll take them first, and then we'll take some more. First, on on whether we should tackle what's happening to academia generally before we start looking at what legal academia can do. Uh, second, that all of this is just an incremental change which we sort of left developing. If I understood the question in the last one, uh, uh, we, we are still not getting through. And what register do we develop to actually achieve that? Who would want to start? Okay. Um, okay. Looking at you. All right, fine. Um, so <laughs> on the, um, the pressures on the academy, which is sort of the consumerization in a sense of the academy, I think these are really important questions, but I don't think we have the luxury of taking one battle at a time. I think in a sense we have to try to deal with these things. We can't just turn inwards and think only about what's happening in the universities. I think we have a, um, a social responsibility beyond that. Um, and. I haven't been through the REF before because you know, I don't, I'm a South African effectively. So, but it does seem to me that uh, there re remains quite a lot of room for choosing the subject area of your research, 
for thinking about how you're going to disseminate it other than in legal articles. But clearly the pressure to publish is an enormous pressure, particularly on young, um, on young scholars. Um, and you know, I, I, if we can't change the way the system works, then we, we're going to have to think about how to advance, give our young scholars greater space. I think one of our biggest challenges, it really comes back to the last question, is how we disseminate the products of our research when it is of great kind of public interest in a way that people can understand and can grasp. And I think we are generally, and well, I, I don't think we're good at this. I think we haven't worked out, I mean, Philippe's, I think Philippe's account is probably one of the exceptions to being able to tell why these things matter. And partly it's going out of the academic register altogether and writing in a way that ordinary people can understand. And I think that's terribly important. I think for the rule of law, for the very reasons you give, um, we haven't done a great job at communicating why this matters and why, it's, why we want to live in a society in which the rule of law is respected. Um, and ditto generally in relation to human rights. So I think that, um, I don't think we can choose one battle. I think we have to, you know, you, we have to deal on, on both levels. It doesn't mean we shouldn't analyze carefully what's happening in universities and seek ways to change that. But our social responsibility as um, academics, I think, it means that we have to engage in the bigger world as well. So I think my experience, actually, I can find a way to link all three questions. Um, I'm going to be very careful what I say, but I think the incrementalism thing is something that we are all going to face in increasing ways. Assume, as a hypothetical, a university that decides that its academics are going to have to start playing a role on policing immigration rules. Is that the function of an academic? I don't think it is. I won't do it under any circumstances, period. Even if there are financial imperatives to do that, that is simply not my function under any circumstances. And I know various universities around the country are beginning to engage and grapple with that. And that, I think, goes to the question of, 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 of what we are as independent scholars and as independent academics. Actually, my experience with the REF has been very positive in terms of what I've been writing. So I wrote a book called East West Street, and my dean, my wonderful former dean, and my wonderful president, but my wonderful former dean said, Philippe, you've got to put footnotes in it. Okay, it's got to have footnotes because it's got to be part of the REFs. So I said, fine, fine, they will have footnotes and I'll make sure. And actually, that goes to your question, which is we have to justify every assertion we make, every factual point we make. I need to be able to support what I found. It's very time consuming, but it gives it a different authority, no question. And so I didn't have any objection to putting in footnotes, except my wonderful publisher in the United States, Alfred Knopf, said no footnotes. Because the empirical evidence is that when books have footnotes, they sell 75% less copies. Because most people don't want to read footnotes. Okay, so how do I balance um, the, the, the legitimate desires of my wonderful dean and the legitimate desires of my wonderful editor? Endnotes, okay? <laughs> Those really irritating endnotes, yeah. <laughs> which don't have a number on the page. The problem for mainstream publishers is when you have a, an, an endnote or a footnote number in the page, it turns people off because they think they're reading an academic book and they don't want to read an academic book, they want to read a normal book, quote unquote. So one option was simply to have no endnotes or footnotes in the published version, but put the endnotes and footnotes on the web. And my dean said, no, that doesn't work for the ref. It's got to be in the published version. And so the upshot is you get these appalling endnotes, thousands of them, where you know, it says page 57. And then he said, and then at the end, and, and, and reading it for an academic, it's just a nightmare to do it. But that's the simple balancing of the commercial and other imperative. And so I think it is doable to straddle both. And then, of course, what you get is when you write a book that does reach a big audience, you get literally thousands of comments saying you made a mistake at page 27, page 412, and of course you go and check them all because, and it's hugely time consuming, and then when the book comes out in 20 languages, and you get it from all over the place, and then when you get comments from Ukraine saying, no, the professor didn't say that at page 212, and then the 
professor from Poland says, yes, he did, and you're balancing with different... It's incredibly time-consuming, but there is a way to do it. And I think that perhaps that only comes at a later stage of your academic life. I made the point very briefly earlier on. I don't think I could have written the books that I wrote when I was 25. I wrote a whole raft of other academic books that followed a much more traditional approach that I'm very proud of. And I couldn't have got to the point, I think, of doing what I've been doing now if I hadn't been through the rigour and the exercise of having to publish law review articles and books that met those traditional criteria. I think what we have is that we have to defend what we make, whether we're writing a book or an academic article or appearing on the BBC or on CNN, we need to be able to substantiate absolutely everything we say. Judith, I know, does it. Kate, as a judge and now as a scholar, does it. And I think that is the difference. It's essentially, I think, about trust and being big enough to own up when you make a mistake and you get it wrong, and you've fallen into error, which we all do, and it's part of life, and that's just how it happens, instead of digging in your heels, being big enough to say, actually, I got that wrong, I'm going to change direction on that. And I think that's what gives the academic uh, an, an absolutely um, special place. So my own experience is that that incrementalism issue is a real issue for scholars. There is a way to move your scholarship into a direction that engages with a different audience, and that's what gives us our heft. But I want to be very clear to say that I don't think, I don't draw any substantive distinction in terms of significance of output or anything between, say, what I've written recently or my wonderful colleague Philip Schofield's work on the Bentham Project, which will be read by far fewer people, but which has a vast social significance over time in terms of scholars who have been working very diligently, perhaps outside the spotlight, helping us understand debates that took place a long time ago. So I, I, I want to very much stress that it's not one size fits all. It's about a community in the legal academe in which different people find their particular place that makes them comfortable. I think that's incredibly important. So the these are very uh, helpful and daunting questions. Um, what is the legal sphere and what is it that we write about? And um, I think there's a potential to come into law schools and say, oh, here's a course called procedure or contract or property and say that's what it is. To 100 years ago, there wasn't actually a course called procedure in US law schools. We just made it up relatively recently. And so the canonicity that look, has a facade of canonicity, and when you come to Bentham, who wrote about absolutely everything, but, pro but proposed to codify it all, and, and wanted it to be understood in its legal register while thinking about every human activity. So uh, you were talking about your funding story. When I um, uh, started teaching, I was told by, I was one of two women on a, another faculty that I'm not on anymore, and the, one of my um, male colleagues, maybe 15 years older than me, thought he was giving me wonderful advice, total fan, don't be visible on women's issues, which he translated as don't teach trust in estates, don't teach, I mean, why trust in estates, women's issues, don't teach family law, don't do gender and sexuality, don't do women's rights, just do, okay. So I teach, so it turns out, as the world turns, that after a while, law schools, looked around and said, oh, there are only two women here, only three women there. Gee, we need some more women. And we'd like them to do something related to gender and women and feminism, although not only do gender and women and feminism. So over time, things that see, climate, who, who knew we all needed environmental climate lawyers? Now it turns out you, can't have, you shouldn't have a law faculty without them. So I, the, the question about what the it is that we're talking about comes back to the question of agency and maybe a cheerfuller story of incrementalism, which is Ruth Bader Ginsburg started a course teaching women's rights at Rutgers when she couldn't get a job in other places. At Rutgers Law School, perfectly wonderful law school in New Jersey, but not as well known as some other law schools. And so courses started because law students 
protested and demanded, per your story, that there be such courses. And law students as drivers of curricular change is important the same way that interdisciplinary change. When I think I'm working with people who run prisons, I have, a lot of them are lawyers. And my students and we are doing all this research together and fussing over why on earth they don't keep the data in any comparable way. So how the hell do you know how many people are in a thing called restricted housing? But I don't think I'm outside the legal sphere. I think we're constantly making more constant legal sphere. And the daunting part about the wrong point the exchange is we've obviously not been able to communicate whatever our blog posts. The due process is a thing that is um, central to trying to figure out the relationship between the state and the individuals in terms of authority and power. And it's a puzzle that it doesn't, mm -hmm. that it, I mean, the Magna Carta has a, I, I don't know what the, those tests would be about pitching buttons, has everybody heard of this, or maybe they don't know what it is, but there is some resonance, one would think, to non-arbitrary treatment by the state in a world that, in which individuals are vulnerable. So, I guess the question for all of us would be, how do you make due process a concept that means everybody wants them? For everybody else, not just themselves. Thank you. I think we have time for another round of <coughs> questions from there. who is the Professor of Public Understanding of Science at Oxford University. He's an amazing character. I'd never met him. I met him in, Bom in Mumbai, Bombay. And um, we had breakfast together in a fantastic place. And I wanted to know all about his job. What does it mean? What do you do when you wake up in the morning as an academic who is responsible for being the Professor of Public Understanding of Science? And it was 
wonderful what he does. He basically just wakes up in the morning and talks to people and helps to make people think about science in different ways. Some of you will know he's an incredibly, he's a wonderful communicator and, and helps to explain amazingly complex um, issues. And I, it, I did say to him at the time, back then, until I, I saw that tweet yesterday, that, that someone ought to be doing the same thing with law because law touches all human behavior and activity. There's nothing that is untouched. And I think we don't fully understand the extent to which um, law informs, as a sort of, you know, international law too, as a sort of quasi-religious structure that creates a belief system that informs behavior in different ways. And one of the things I've definitely learned in the last 15 years, having started writing books since 2005, with Lawless World on Iraq and then Torture Team on the, the Rumsfeld Memo and then East West Street, is there's a huge appetite out there. I mean, it's a source of intense and immense happiness to me that I get letters from around the world from people saying they, gosh, they'd never thought about the relationship between genocide and crimes against humanity. They just thought they were the same thing and they, were, they meant the same thing. And, they, and, and the connection to people from all different backgrounds who start thinking about the Aki of 1945. And it's a way of segueing into my dear friend Sam Moyne, who's sitting in the back over here. You didn't know that. But I mean, I think Sam Moyne is a fantastic thing. I think it's the function of scholars to constantly challenge, to attack traditional narratives and discourses, and constantly, constantly get us to rethink what it is we're doing and why we do it. That is the essence of an academic community. That said, I'm in fundamental disagreement with him on a lot of issues. I agree on many. But something dramatic changed in 1945. And what changed in 1945, and I speak here as a public international lawyer, was until that moment, it was a legal order that was concerned exclusively with relations between states. That was how international law was. And the tiny change that happened in 1945, which is hugely significant at all sorts of levels and contested even more so today, is that states are not the sole actors, or not the only subjects, and actually individuals, corporations, NGOs, intergovernmental organizations, exist as players. It is, frankly, nothing more than that change. But that is a revolutionary change. What happened in 1945 was a revolution. And what's happening right now, and it won't succeed any more than the Bush administration succeeded. I mean, coming back to Chris's point, it is you cross one line and then you're in another place, and then you cross another line and you're in another place. But I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever. But I take a multi-century perspective, as I tell my students who are feeling pretty glum right now. This is a 500-year project. This is not a 10-year project. It's not a 50-year project. You've got to think 500 years. The person I draw my profoundest inspiration from is the former professor of English legal history at Cambridge University, John Baker. I used to be a fellow, at some, a research fellow at St. Catharines with him, and I'd in the late 80s, and I'd say to him, oh, I'm doing this really interesting thing about international law, and he'd say, oh, what is it, what is it? And then he'd say, goshfully, we dealt with that problem in English law in 1472. It started, and it took us 260 years to sort it out, and that's international law. We're in the medieval ages. I mean, we're right at the beginning of a long game, and if you put it in that perspective, It'll be two steps forward, a step sideways, a step backwards, another step forward, another step sideways, three more steps backwards, five steps forward. That's the way the world is domestically, regionally, and internationally. And it allows me, at least, to be optimistic. Thank you, Ed. Will we go check it? OK. Um, so I'm pleased you raised the question of companies and human rights, because I think this is an area that's growing dramatically. It also indicates, I think, <coughs> that whatever this term means, 
it's got some purchase that is really leverageable in a whole variety of ways. Um, and in fact, um, at, at, at the Bonaventure Institute in Oxford, it's one of the things students have come to us and said, we're going to have a weekly discussion group on the issues, and there are many. There's jurisdiction, standing, remedies, tort, millions of, of legal issues that re relate to holding companies accountable for human rights uh, violations. So I think it's an important area. I think we should be thinking about it. In many ways, it's not one area, it's a new way of thinking about legal personality, which is what a corporation is, and thinking about what the accountability and responsibility of, of legal personality brings. Um, on the, um, the question about human rights and politics and the public understanding of law, so human rights, this is a big question, um, but, but, but my sense is that trying to get a one-size-fits-all for this concept in any deeply conceptual way is very difficult and generally drives you either into a narrow understanding, uh, which um, which doesn't, which perhaps in in some it seems to be helpful in some ways, but it's not part of the lived practice of the politics of human rights of most jurisdictions. And I think, to the extent one's talking about jurisdictions and bills of rights and so on, I think for lawyers the answer to this question really is remains more a question of domestic law than it does of international law, even though, of course, international law is terribly important. Um, and I think the lines are drawn differently in different constitutional settings. So certainly the South African one constitution has got a very particular way of drawing this line, a way that completely Im puts into the centre of the picture the question of economic and social rights and inequality in ways that it's not put in in lots of other frameworks. And I think that's part of our history, it's partly who we are and it's partly when, when we came to the project. But I don't think you can say that it's the same as the way the project operates, for example, um, in Canada or in um, the United Kingdom. And so this is, um, this is uh, something that varies from society to society. One last thought on this, which is that it's quite surprising to a South African to find the scepticism and almost hostility with which the term is approached in the United Kingdom. And that's partly because we still remember many, many people being woken up at three o'clock in the morning by it's the police and people disappearing into detention, sometimes never to return. And that, that cultural and social memory means that issues around, you know, not the right to be able to go to a police station and say, where is my family member? Not for everybody, but certainly for a lot of people still very, really remains in the, in the, in the popular mind. And so we get relatively little pushback on the concept and on the idea that um, we want a different way of um, understanding the, our relationship with the state. And again, I'm not saying it's, you know, it's very messy, but it, it, it's, there isn't that immediate memory here for many people. And I think that that is a factor in, um, in our understanding of human rights. Uh, the interaction between the questions about the public and the private um, and the category of social and economic rights and human rights. I'm a skeptic about pigeonholes that suggest that there's that kind of right and then there's that kind of right and we can talk about them and they walk and look differently. So Virginia Woolf in the 1920s said, as here women were about to get votes, uh, get the vote as between uh, a vote and 500 pounds a year and a lock on the door, <laughs> she'd go for economic and physical security. Um, it looks like in the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women in the 1980s, the list goes through much of that, although physical security comes in later as violence against women comes to be understood as a form of discrimination and subordination. But along the way, CETA of course talks about economic rights and employment possibilities and education possibilities and public and private reach as well. So I think in terms of how we could help the public understand a layered world, that's of course hard with the sound bites. And does due process make a bullet or a sound bite? Or if I tweet due process, what happens? Um, uh, you'll find out, you'll tell me in what, what number and who will write to where. But so I think it's um, in a world that is turning rapidly and uh, maybe not so incrementally in terrible ways. Um, I don't think that we should be engaged in thinking about the pigeonholes because the broad project is obviously that there's an enormous interdependency 
between physical safety, the electricity working, and the ability to imagine yourself alive with people, some of whom aren't called citizens and may not look in any way like you and not speak like you. And so the project of sort of how does law help enable people to see a fabric of shared concerns? And the old phrase is about peace and securing the peace and security of the state. Instead of seeing that as kind of old fashioned, that's a good thing to aspire to. But it doesn't mean you have to be exclusionary. And so the question, and I don't think we have to be exclusionary about what kind of right that is either. In the United States, there's a while there's a debate about do we need human rights because we've got civil rights. Um, do we get anywhere by asking that, or can we help move everybody forward in this, which doesn't answer the how will a judge actually judge in an individual case? That's a discrete question. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think we could probably continue for, for many more hours, and uh, maybe we'll get to the point, actually, that the role of legal academia is not to be confined to the schedule of a one-and-a-half-hour <laughs> panel. Uh, <laughs> But we have promised everyone some drinks after this, and, uh, uh, and I think for now we, we will stick to, to our schedule and conclude the proceedings here. Um, I, I do want to sort of invite everyone in, in the room to continue to share the reflection about what, what we can do in this complex world to advocate the, the values which law embodies, and we'll definitely try to do more things here at UCL around this with friends from, from other institutions and from, from around the globe. So watch this, uh, this space and uh, uh, I'm sure you will all join me in thanking our absolutely fabulous panel of speakers. <laughs> <laughs>